Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Family Church. Happy Fourth of July weekend. I hope you've had a great time with family and friends. We're going to get right into the book of Mark today. So if you want to open your Bibles up, I'll be in chapter 7. And if you're new and joining us, I want to encourage you to go back and watch some of the previous messages so you can get caught up. And our desire through this process is we get to know who Jesus is and just how much we can trust not only who he is, but what he's doing in our book and how, what he's doing for us today. So uh, as we're kind of walking through this, let's just kind of start off today with the question, do you have family traditions? And my guess is you just came in a holiday weekend where you had some traditions. And traditions are good things. Uh, there's lots of good reasons for traditions, but traditions be can become a problem when they begin to supersede or take the place even sometimes of God in our life. And so uh, I had this story I found, this, uh, this author, Kevin Carothers, I can't pronounce his name correctly, but thanks Kevin for the story. But it was about a church where a new pastor attended. There was a long time pastor, over 40 years, who had pastored this church. And his first weekend, he stood up and the congregation began to sing and they all turned and faced an opposite wall of the stage. And they all sang and he thought, Okay, so he turns and he faces that wall. And the next weekend, it happens again. They stand up to sing. They turn and they face the opposite wall. And of course, he becomes very inquisitive. Why are you standing up and facing the opposite wall? And people didn't know. That's just a tradition in this church. Apparently, we stand and we face the opposite wall. So he, he began to survey people in the church and found an older gentleman who had been there since he was a child. And he says, well, actually, I think I know why we do that. Back earlier when I was a kid, the, the pastor wanted to teach us songs. We didn't have all the electronics of today. So he would write the words on the wall. It was a big barren wall, and the congregation would turn and face that wall to sing. But as hymnals came into kind of play, people were holding books, and as people became familiar with the songs, they didn't get rid of the tradition. And what a weird moment. Can you imagine? Everybody stands up, you're thinking, oh, good, here's the the auditorium, and there's going to be a, a team who's leading us in praise, and the entire congregation turns, faces the other way. Now, this isn't like a dangerous tradition. It's a weird tradition, nonetheless, but they weren't like holding it in some reverent way. There was just something that they did, and they got caught up in, and nobody questioned it once the need didn't exist anymore. And so in our story, we're going to look at traditions today. We're going to look at how traditions can be really beautiful. Jesus instituted traditions, ways in which we should operate, but also the dangers of that. Um, and just to kind of catch you up, this last week, we've, last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Jesus continuing to prove that the kingdom of God is near. And so we've seen him walk on water. That must have been an incredible moment. I love in the passage, it's like he's just cruising by. Like, hey guys, what's happening? <laughs> like, this is an incredible moment for these disciples. Um, he's been feeding the 5,000. This is that famous story of this two fish and five loaves of bread. And, and if you were there, it probably would have been a stunning experience to see the continual multiplication of food. We've seen him heal the blind and the leprous. We've also seen him assume the authority to forgive sins. And of course, all of this commotion, all of these miracles, all of the evidence of the kingdom of God being near is creating a lot of tension in the community. And so we've got the scribes and the Pharisees in our story today. These are religious leaders, Jewish leaders, high in the upper echelons of leadership. And they are really frustrated and they're beginning to get angry at how Jesus is behaving because he's going against them and what they thought the kingdom of God looked like. And so we're going to get right into chapter 7. So if you want to follow with me, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Now when the Pharisees gathered to him uh, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly. So let's set the stage for a moment. This isn't a hygiene lesson. Um, I don't think this had anything to do with, and most of the scholars agree, with them not ever washing their hands. They weren't filthy. There's something at play. Imagine if you go into a market to buy food and you bump somebody who culturally is unclean. 
This is part of the process of reminding yourself of the purity of God and the reminder of who God is. So there was a ceremony that was kind of elevated, so it was an outward show of how, how much you loved God, how, how incredible God is, and how pure God is. So it became this tradition of show. Did you do it the right way? And so in this, in this area, we see this is a cultural symbol that's really showing God's holiness and his purity and every, spec, every aspect of their lives, including when they eat. Well, that's a good thing. It's good to be reminded of God in all these things. But what was happening is they're looking at the disciples saying, you're coming in and you're not going through the right rituals. You may be washing your hands for cleanliness, but you're not doing it in the way that, that we should do this. And so therefore you're defiled. Whatever you touched has, has now come to you and you're going to eat and ingest this defiling. And so it goes on, it says, For the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And this is a, an interesting word, this wash. This is really, in the Greek, is the word that we get baptism from. So the picture is a purification ceremony, a, a showing of the holiness of God on display by outward cleanliness. And in this, in this part, they're, they're trying to do a good job of giving glory to God but we're going to see that Jesus is going to turn the tables, so to speak, on them. They're going to begin to wrestle with what is really happening because they're very caught up in the outward show, but not necessarily the inward transformation. And so it goes on, it says, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not wash their hands? Let me read that again. I skipped a slide, I'm sorry. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, the hypocrites, as it is written. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written. There's this, uh, Jesus is going to begin to speak directly now to this problem. What is going on? in your hearts. See, uh, the prophet Isaiah, of course, prophesied of these days that would come. This is a, a prophet of the Old Testament. This is prior to Jesus' arrival, who spoke of his arrival coming, and, and he would speak of this heart issue that was going on. So why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? This is, this is the innate problem. Did you hear that? Why are they Follow, not following their traditions. This is a big piece. There's this um, study, this, this Mishnah study. And apparently this idea is it's a greater offense to teach anything contrary to the voice of the rabbis than to contradict Scripture. There's, there was a movement happening where whoever your rabbi was, whatever they said carried more weight and value than maybe even Scripture itself. And the Mishnah was a book that helped to not teach the law of Moses or the law the Jews were to follow, but how to operate within that law. And there became this, this battle for whatever your rabbi was teaching had more weight than maybe even the very word of God. And so if the rabbi said, wash your hands exactly this way, even though it wasn't found in scripture, then you were to follow that, that pattern, that pattern of living. And the problem, of course, we could see with that is all of a sudden we could run into some real problems. Because if as a rabbi, as a Jewish leader, I find myself teaching my disciples something outside of what God's plan was, I then set them on a course to no longer even obey God's word itself. Instead, to obey me. And so you can imagine the, the tension that's going on. Jesus is going to confront this problem head on. Look at the next verse as we go in. Uh, continuing to verse 6, And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain do they worship me, 
teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Listen to this, verse 8. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the the tradition of men. You leave the commandment of God and you hold to the tradition of men. So, in other words, let's, let's put that into simple verbs, simple words here. You work hard to look good on the outside, to look pure on the outside. You're working really hard for that, but all that labor's in vain. Because everything you're doing to look good doesn't come from a heart motivation. It comes from a pride motivation. It comes from a motivation that says, I want to prove to God how good I am. I want to prove to the community how much I love God by all of the actions I'm doing, but deep in my heart, it's all show. Because what's happening on the outside is not representative of what's really transformed on the inside. So Jesus is addressing their heart. Look what he says. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And then he says to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. And then he's going to address a very specific problem that was going on in this community. Verse 10 says, For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, Whatever you have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down and many such things you do. So what does that mean in essence? There was a commandment, honor your father and mother, care for them. And there's a cultural mandate and tradition to take care of them in their aging years. It's a provision that God had put in place to care for the elderly, that families were required. This is, this is part of it. But here's what happened. This idea, this, this idea says Corbin. It's, in, it's Corbin. This word basically means, uh, or this, I, the concept of this is you give money in place of caring for your parents. You give it to the, the temple and the leaders of the temple benefit from that, that income. And now, You've been telling them because you've given money to the temple, you don't have to care for your parents anymore. You've given it to God. You don't have to care for them. You've given it to God. And can you see the the tension that Jesus is, is bringing into the room? He said, your tradition is now pay money, ignore your parents. But God's commandment was honor your father and mother. Care for them. There's a huge problem between those two, those two issues. And Jesus is addressing their heart. And he says, you do such, uh, many such things. This isn't the only one. So he's drawing them in, bringing the attention to this. He says, look, your traditions have a problem. So in verse 14, he says, and he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of the person are what? defile him. So Jesus is now going to go right in headlong into the heart. He says, you have a heart problem. And the heart problem is the things that look good on the outside, you can perform all day long, but it doesn't address this heart. And so the point I wanted to draw out today is that there's a danger of tradition. And traditions are good. There are good traditions that that are good for your family. They remind you of just the beauty of family or something in your culture that help carry just a part of kind of how you exist. And they're good for us. They, They help establish memories and good memories and good times. But if the traditions begin to replace the authority of God's word, we run into a problem. So let me say that again. Our traditions should never replace the authority of God's word. This is what was happening to the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jewish community. They were taking God's word, setting it aside, creating a tradition that appeared to be still in cooperation with God's word, but then living it out in a way that didn't bring glory to God, didn't honor God for his commandments, didn't show the community how beautiful God is, that he's holy and pure and righteous. They decided to create traditions. And so let's ask a few personal questions. Do you have any traditions in your house? 
Are there any traditions that you, you carry on? Look at the, the text here specifically. Jesus says, you leave the commandments of God, and he says, the second part of verse 9, rejecting the commandments of God. Are there any traditions in your life that have begun to replace God's word? Now, now, many of us, like, we set up Christmas trees, Christmas time. And it's a beautiful thing in our family. I love, I love to look at the, the ornaments of my kids as they grew up. And I even have some from my birthday back in 1972, my first birthday Christmas celebration. I, I have those, and the traditions are fun to look at those. And maybe I put the lights up, and maybe I put the lights on the outside of the house. And those are good things. They're not, I don't see anything wrong with that. Let's enjoy the festive decorations. But what happens if subtly, I say, well, I don't have to witness. I don't have to share the gospel. Look, I put Christmas lights out. Like, everybody knows I love Jesus because I put Christmas lights on my tree and on my house. In fact, we don't even go to church during Christmas and gather as, as the church gathers because we've got a tree in our house now. And that's evidence that I love God. And all of a sudden, suddenly, I begin to shift from what well, was just a good tradition as a family and remembering who Jesus is to a replacement, perhaps even of the gospel itself. Let me press a little harder. This, this one kind of gets to me a little bit because it comes up frequently, and it's around communion. The way we do communion here at Family Church, or the way you grew up doing communion in your, in your history or the churches you attended. So I just came back from Mexico, and at their church, their local community gatherings, they only receive communion once a year. They choose to do it on Good Friday, and it's a big celebration. It's a big time of remembrance and confession and repentance. And that's the way that they've chosen as a community to remember God through, and, and the sacrifice of Christ through communion. And there are some of you hearing that would be like shocked. How could you wait a whole year? And there are some that you come each week and you say, why don't we have communion every week? And even last week, there were some who said, why did we do it a week early? Get, oh no, we're, we're off kilter. The, the tradition isn't the same. What, is God going to be glorified and pleased if we don't have it on this day? When we go back to Scripture and what did Scripture teach us? As often as you do this, remember me. It didn't say you have to do it every day or every week or every month, but when you do it, make sure you know why and the heart behind it is in glory to God and giving Him glory. And confessing and repenting and remembering the sacrifice is why it was there when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me when you eat and when you drink this bread and this cup. Do this in remembrance of me. But we can subtly begin to creep in and say, you don't do it right because you don't do it often enough. Or you don't do it right because you don't have people get up and go to the front. Or you don't do it right because we don't all drink from one cup. Or you don't do it right because you don't have it handed out. Or you don't do it right because it's in a little plastic container. Or you don't do it right. And we begin to put a tradition of men over what God said. No, 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 no. I just said when you do this, make sure you know the heart. Do it in remembrance of me. Let that, let that be the motivation because my sacrifice is complete. Everything was done. Jesus fulfilled everything that was required. And we have freedom now because of what Christ did. So rest in that. And if you feel led that you should go and receive communion with, with a group of people, then, then you can do that. Do that and, and rejoice in what God is doing. But don't get caught up in the traditions that we so easily slip into because we become really, honestly, we become addicted to the pattern of the tradition. And then when it replaces God, when it becomes idolatry. So I just think it's good for us to use great caution, just like the men here in the story, the scribes and Pharisees, that Jesus was saying, look, don't take God's word and set it aside and let your tradition somehow replace him. Be cautious of that. So we move into this story, and if you've been reading along or maybe you've been looking at your Bible right now, you realize I just ended at verse 15. My next slide is verse 17, so we're going to pause for a second. There's this weird thing that happens in the book of Mark, and it's, it's verse 16. And so if you look in your Bibles right now, now you're now I know you're all looking like, what? There's no verse 16? So depending on the, the translation you're looking at, verse 16 is in a little bit of quandary. 
And so rather than spend a whole sermon trying to unpack that, I just want to give you just a simple idea. In your sermon notes, there's a link that does take you to one study you can go look through to learn a little bit more about the history of why this particular verse is in contention. But here's what it says. If you go to the King James, um, we've heard Jesus say this over and over again. He says, if anyone has ears, let him hear. So that's, the, that's verse 16 that may not appear in your text. And hopefully your Bible has a little sub note that says, hey, by the way, this is, this is in contention. And really, it comes down to where the source came from. Did it show up in original manuscripts or did it show up in later manuscripts? And it's really the heart of where it comes to. And so I just want to make it clear, this isn't a doctrinal problem. It doesn't change the gospel. It doesn't change the, the meaning of the Bible. It doesn't change the theological impact of how the gospel uh, brings us life and salvation in Christ. But it is one of those questions. And that's one of the reasons some people say, oh, it's got to be King James, and that's why. But then there's some other stuff in the King James that's also contentious because they, uh, the scholars argue there's not enough supporting documents for some of those passages. So if you want to look more into it, just take some time this weekend, go through that study. Um, but the main thing I think we want to, one, I don't want to hide from it. It's there. It's been there a long time. This isn't the first time it's ever shown up. Hundreds of years have gone by and they're trying to wrestle with what to do with it. Um, but secondly, it is in line with what Jesus says frequently. If anyone has ears, come, let them hear. But there is some contention about whether it should be in this text or if it came later as an add-on. So hopefully that gives you some clarity. Um, I know it's always tough when we get into like some of the theological stuff around translation and the Bible translation. But take a look at that. And if you have questions, certainly be happy to, to talk with you. You can email them. Love to talk about that. We're going to continue on, though, at verse 17. So let's just make sure we're caught up in the story. Jesus now has addressed the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, look, you're doing things. You've replaced God's word now. You've taken your traditions and elevated them above God himself. And so he then goes away with his disciples. And that's where we're at in verse 17. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. Don't you love how this must be wearing on Jesus? Like, you guys, you've seen so much. How do you keep missing what I'm teaching? But Jesus is gracious and he says to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled, Thus he declared all foods clean. And this was a challenge. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. When you think through Jesus' teaching, I want you to think about really the heart issue that he's addressing here. Think about the story. They're, they're concerned about how they wash their hands. They're concerned about how they're washing their cups. They're concerned about how they're operating on the outside. But the heart of the matter is, Jesus says, all of those things don't help you with a spiritual problem. The spiritual problem is your heart. So I want to kind of bring this point out today that God desires your heart. And the heart is an interesting thing. We, you and I know this is an organ that, that pumps blood through our body. <clears throat> but the heart, this word lavav is a Hebrew word. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that, so sorry for the Hebrew scholars. Horrible pronunciation. But this is where you make your choices and where your desires are motivated. This is that essence of who you are, the very core of who you are. And I know that I believe any, all of you in this room have that sinking heartbreak feeling when you experience loss that you don't feel here. It's something about this part of me, the very core of who I am, where I just, I grieve deeply in this part of me. I also rejoice in this part of me. It's, it's, not, it's not here. It's this weird essence, this core of who I am, the very heart of me. It's this desire of the heart that, that Jesus and speaks of 
and that we see throughout Scripture that God desires you to, to love Him and to worship Him with your whole heart, your whole body, your soul, the wholeness of who you are, everything. And here's this moment. Jesus is addressing to them the heart issue. He says, don't you get it? You can go around and wash all you want. You could be germ-free perfect. Your clothes could be absolutely lined up exactly as the, as the, the tradition was required at one time. You could do all the sacrifices as what were required, but I've come, the kingdom of God is near, to finish that work. And I want your heart. See, you can wash your hands, but you can't wash your heart. Only Jesus can do that. You can't, there's no, <laughs> there's no soap that's going to take care of this issue. So Jesus desires your body, your mind, your, your feeling, your desires, your future, your failures, all of it to be placed on him. Look at what he said again. He says, For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts. Now, from this context, think about it this way. Uh, the Jews at this time, of course, they couldn't eat pork. There were other food restrictions. And the thought was, you know, it, originally this was instituted by God to set them apart. They were to be set apart to show the purity and the holiness of God. But Jesus is kind of turning the tables now and saying, that was intended to point to your need for me, that you can't be clean without me. That was the goal. And I'm here. The kingdom of God is here. He says, so here's the deal. Because I eat pork doesn't mean coveting comes out of me. What I, what I eat, the things I put in, the things I touch innately, the germs that I touch in the marketplace, because I put those in, I might get sick, but it doesn't defile the real problem. And the real problem was sin in my heart. That this is the source of where all of these evil things come out of. But praise be to God, Jesus says, but I came that I could transform that, that I could wash you and make you white as snow. That I would be the ultimate sacrifice, the one who would fulfill exactly what was promised and prophesied. And I'm here, he would say. I came for this moment that you could be clean. And I want you to think about how much freedom would that be if you were a Jew of the day when you finally realized, you mean I don't, I don't have to ceremonially do this hand-washing thing? Like, that's not of any benefit to me? He says, well, the hygiene, yes, please, please wash your hands. But no, that's not changing your heart. See, Jesus says, I want to transform you from the inside out so that on the outside, the fruit of your life is evidence of the transforming work inside. We talk a lot about fruit of the Spirit, and that's, that's the, the beauty of you and me as followers of Christ today. He says, when you place your faith in Christ, all is forgiven. Your internal heart, the very heart of who you are, is transformed. That hard exterior is removed. The heart of God is Im implanted in you by the Spirit of God. And then the outside workings of that should be the beautiful gifts of the Spirit, that you experience joy and your community sees it and experiences the kingdom of God in that joy. That peace that flows out of you is a result of the transforming work of the heart. Because the danger is you and I, we can look at this list and we can say, I'm going to prove to God how much I love him and I'm never going to do any one of these ever again. And it doesn't take long before we find ourselves right back where we started. And evil thoughts and sexual immorality and theft and murder, adultery, all of this that comes out, we, we have pride issues. It just flows out of us. And we, in our strength, we can't fix that problem. And if you're in Christ, the, the desire and the goal then is as you partner with God, this list slowly diminishes as the fruit of your life. And it's replaced with the fruit that God provides of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. I mean, think of how beautiful that is. And that's what flows from the outside. I'm so grateful that Jesus says, look, there's a huge heart problem, but I'm the heart surgeon. I'm the one who can give you everything that your heart truly desires. These are the things you've fought for and you've fought against. And my desire is that you would come to me and you would repent and you would rest in my goodness and you would let me transform you from the inside out so that you can live a life that glorifies God because God is in you and God is with you.
I love you guys. I hope you have a great day as you uh, kind of close with the campuses and uh, happy 4th of July. Talk to you soon.